I guess a lot of people must have asked you from time to time, wouldn't it have been a lot easier for you if you had, uh, well, just sort of kept quiet about the whole thing? Edward R. Morrow in See It Now. Good evening. A few weeks ago, there occurred a few obscure notices in the newspapers about a lieutenant, Milo Radulovich, a lieutenant in the Air Force Reserve, and also something about Air Force Regulation 35-62, the case of Lieutenant Radulovich. Our reporter, Joe Wurstberg, cameraman, Charlie Mack. This is the town of Dexter, Michigan. Population, 1,500. I went into the bar. I said, anybody here know about the Radulovich case? Sure, we all know about that goddamn case. I said, uh, anybody here want to talk on television? This burly guy with a scruffy, uh, unshaven face. He said, I'm head of the American Legion Post here, and I'll talk to you. He said, if they can do that to him, they can do that to me without any evidence and the railroad. Uh, and, you know, if we had him alone, it would have been a, a, a surefire bet. Tonight, See It Now devotes its entire half hour to a report on Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. He has traveled far, interviewed many, terrorized some, accused civilian and military leaders of the past administration of a great conspiracy to turn over the country to communism. Are you enjoying this abuse of the general? <laughs> I felt that this was the greatest thing that I had in my personal life had ever come across. We're standing uh, at Armageddon, uh, ready for war, and we could easily have been destroyed. Just. McCarthy coming back, ripping us apart, and uh, had he succeeded in knocking Morrow off, the history of the country, I believe, would have been quite different. Then he would have stood astride the whole nation as the power, that the White House would have been humbled secondary to him. I was a voracious reader right from the start, and I could read uh, Yiddish, and I could read uh, Hebrew, uh, and I uh, sort of, uh, once we got a copy of the Book of Knowledge, they had French lessons in there, so I studied French by myself. By the time I was in high school at Lincoln High School in Brooklyn, I was already writing pieces for the school paper, and I signed them the old professor. <laughs> and one day I showed up at the main office of the newspaper and uh, the older students uh, on the paper had a field day with me. Hey, everybody come see the old professor, a little fat kid, roly-poly. I was very much involved in writing at that time. And I, as I say, from the start, I knew I was going to be a writer, newspaper writer, not a writer writer, but a newspaper writer. Good evening, everybody. Coast to coast, Douglas Edwards reporting. Walter Cronkite reporting. Uh, out of the army, by pure luck, I was walking past CBS and I met a young woman who had been an editor at my high school paper, who by that time was well known as the first woman director in radio or possibly in television. And I said, how do you apply for a job at CBS? She said, go up to the 17th floor and see uh, Everett Hollis and he'll probably give you a test. They were taking people on. So I did. And I looked to see how the other people had written their news broadcasts. And I said, holy gee, I've been writing like this since I was 14. So within a week, I was hired. I started as a writer. And uh, because I had experience in newspapers, they made me a, uh, like a senior writer. And that was another reason that uh, the woman I was going to marry was annoyed with me because she came on as a junior writer. And her pay was much less than mine. I think I was getting 40 bucks, and I think she was getting 25. And that was another reason why she took her vengeance on me and married me. This is the CBS Television Network. I became aware of television uh, when they asked me to do it. Then I went on every night on WTOP, which was our station owned by the Washington Post and CBS, and it would be on for half an hour. Television. Cronkite. Uh, who had been doing work in radio for CBS was tagged as the anchor man for this nightly broadcast. It was not called an anchor man at that time yet. Walter would come on for eight or nine minutes, 
I would then come on for about five doing an interview with somebody in the news. I left CBS, but as I say, I worked on CBS projects and did, did an album with Morrow. Then I worked on films. Um, then I worked for six years with the New York Post doing a column uh, and general reporter, and I was nominated by my paper for a Pulitzer on, the, uh, on Lee Harvey Oswald and JFK. Uh, I spent 20 years with 60 Minutes. I was one of the founding producers. Mike Wallace and I have just returned from Northern Ireland, where he, living with and reporting on the Protestants, and I, living with and reporting on the Catholics, have tried to get a sharper focus on the conflict there that has pitted these two groups against each other. We were going to film in that Friday night, payday night, in a Protestant bar, where Mike Wallace would come in and his first question of the Protestant was going to be, why the hell is it you guys are mistreating the Catholics, which would have been enough to get us killed. He almost said that. Before that happened, I had a deal with my, um, and my crew was with me, with the owner of the bar, Huey Begg. He says, now listen, I gotta tell you something, but if any of you guys here pointing at crew is a Catholic, I'm gonna throw you the f right out of the window right now. And I didn't know whether he was joking or serious. So I assumed he was serious. I said, now wait a minute. I've never asked these guys what their religion is, and I don't care. But I want to tell you something. They are working for me. I'm the boss, and I'm a Jew. He said, you're all right. And he took out a card, and he enrolled me in the Ulster Volunteer Defense Force, which was like the IRA is to the Catholics. Two attractive people alone in the copy room. Well, don't tell Paley, you'll fire me. Both of us, sure. Good night and good luck. The real-life couple consulted on the new film. You could tell that a lot of the people were worried stiff about what the consequences of this program would be, and Murrow caught that and said, Tara is right here in this room. I did. You got it. You got it.